everybody, Lisa here. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, we are doing Tarot de Marseille on Earth and we are nearing the end of this journey together and I have to say this has opened up my eyes about different ways of approaching the tarot and I've really been enjoying it. I hope you've been enjoying it as well. Um, as always, I really welcome your feedback and your comments below as you've been traveling this journey with me. Hopefully, if you are watching this video, it means that you have finished interlude number four which is called on being wrong and all of section three nope what's it called section well it's called lesson eight to visual language so hopefully you finished all of that by the time you're watching this otherwise this isn't going to make a lot of sense so that is the section we are on the interlude here about being wrong is really a useful little breather from uh, the exercises that we've been doing because I think it's really easy uh, particularly in an earthy approach to tarot like this is a really grounded practical kind of linear approach I think that the idea of allowing yourself that permission to not worry about accuracy or being perfect is really useful and important so hopefully you got something juicy and good out of that I certainly did I always appreciate that reminder that we are human beings that we're not foolproof that our own biases and our own stuff is going to come into play. I really did appreciate that section. Moving into visual language. Boy, I struggled with this section with the Marseille because I'll be honest, I am not coming to this system so much for visual language. So this really challenged me. And I don't think it's a bad thing to be challenged. I think sometimes I lack patience, but it was good for me to muddle through it in my own way and whatever and kind of glean what I could from this section. But boy, I can't so easily turn off the embedded understanding I have of court cards or of trumps when I'm looking at visual cues. Um, and there was a lot here about looking at like even like the little plant life here or like looking at ooh, bend in my deck while I try to show you stuff. Um, or looking at like, for example, the Four of Cups and how each one is isolated. Um, so this section talks a lot about that sort of thing and how we can get visual cues even from these non-illustrated, so non-illustrated, no, that's the wrong term, non-scenic, that's a better term, term, because of course they're all illustrated, they've all been drawn or painted or whatever. Um, but there is visual cues you can take from these cards, which is what this whole section is all about. And he kind of gave us opportunities to look at that and to decide where we could get some of those visual cues. Now I did find, and I think this is useful, I started to, when I was in the court section, I automatically, and I don't do this so much in writer at all, I think when I'm working with writer weight, see if I can find some examples. I did find myself looking to, when I laid cards out, who was facing what direction, what they were looking toward and what they were facing away from, which is something that's addressed in the book. Um, but I did that in a natural way. That wasn't something, that was something that I was already doing before it came up in this section on visual language. And I found that really interesting because the, the pips, when you lay out cards, the pips don't draw the eye the same way that people do because there's people only in the courts or in some of the majors. So I really found myself diving a little deeper into the body language of the courts and into the body language in the majors and it really informed how I read a few cards in a row um, or the way that I looked at like say a nine card spread. So I did find myself doing that automatically so when I got into this section it was actually kind of kind of cool to have the validation that that's where we were headed. When we get into exercises the first exercise is about reading the question and a client profile and then answering. And this was actually really good uh, because it was really useful to have context. And one of the things that is talked about in this book is that there's nothing wrong with using that context. Uh, at least that's what I took from it. <laughs> I don't know what the actual intent was, but that was what I took from it is that when you're reading for a real person, you know a little bit about that person that you pick up either from their body language, from what they tell you, from the information they offer about their situation, to the way that they respond to different cards. All of that is part of reading and that doesn't make us like a fraud. Like that's part of the experience of reading for another person. And I think where I have the most validating experiences with tarot is when I have a personal feeling about how a question's going to read in the cards 
and I actually get dissonance between what I see in the person and what the cards say. That to me is always a really validating experience in a different way than it's validating when the cards say exactly what I expect they're going to say for that person. So both things are useful. When it's in dissonance, I'm like, wow, my intuition is digging into some stuff I couldn't notice on the surface. And sometimes when they're in harmony, it's validation that what I see on the surface is what's really going on. And every reading is different and every client is different and every person that you read for is different. Where this is trickier is, of course, when you're reading for yourself and you're like, am I being biased about myself? Like, how's that going? Um, but I did really enjoy this exercise and in having some context for the person because it did make it easier to dive into the cards and sort of see what came up. So these were three card draws. And was that the assignment or did I make it three card? They might have been intended to be nine. Let's see. Yeah, three trump cards for each question. Yeah, so I found this really fun and useful. And I, as I did whenever he gave us exercises where we get to play with our cards, because that's what I'm here for. I'm all about the actually getting my hands on the cards and digging in. Um, so I really enjoyed doing that. And I really enjoyed, again, the validation that came with that. Now, there, the next activity, I legitimately wrote that I hated this exercise. <laughs> because it was not at all something I could relate to. And this was picturing the pips. And this was literally where you were supposed to use your pips and the bit of graphical cues that you could get from them. Um, you were only supposed to use the visual aspects of a card, like not your meanings. My brain, when it has information, because I'm a visual learner, this sounds really counterintuitive, but because I'm a visual learner, everything's kind of mashed together in one big information ball and it's really hard for me to parse out just this piece of information. So when I pull like a pip card and I'm like, I see, I see the Eight of Cups. I'm like, okay, order and um, harmony and emotional, like a, a stage of emotional growth and where have we reached? Like all the information that I've just been studying just pops into my head like in an instant. So then I'm like looking at how these are all separated and my brain just kind of does a little explodey thing, like poof, and then it's all gone. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be looking at. Um, I think for me, I... I can't look at this and get visual cues. It's just not, I like my fully illustrated, graphically intense sort of tarot decks for that. For this, I want to look at the number and think numerology and think about what that could mean in the context. It just didn't make sense to try, for me, to try to merge those two things, the sort of linear mathiness of working with the pip deck that I'd been working on this whole book with the more visual experience that I have with Rider Waite decks. To me, if I want that visual experience, I'm gonna to go to a Rider Waite deck for it. And if I want to think in a more expansive, open way in numerological terms, I'm gonna to go to a Marseille deck or a Pip style deck. Uh, so I didn't do that exercise. I kind of played with it, I tried it, and I was like, no, this is not for me. And hopefully that gives some of you some like reassurance that you don't have to love every single section to get useful information out of this experience and it did not make me close the book and throw it across the room or like decide to stop this whole thing but it was a moment where I had to really give myself that permission to go no mm -mm, not this one this one's not working for me I literally wrote nope on one of the pages because I was like this is not working it wasn't working for me um so activity 8.4 back to life was when it was time to read for other people so this is something that I'm going to be doing in an ongoing way. So I haven't like done it specifically in relation to the book because we're nearing the end and I know I'm going to be playing with the pip cards quite a lot. And I am going to be diving probably for myself into another Marseille book after this so that I can get a different take on these. So I'm not going to be like specifically setting aside time to do readings. I have to say though, one thing I really appreciated about this book is all of the practice questions and the opportunities to try practice readings for fake people. That's actually been really useful. And from what I've seen in the Supportive Tarot Facebook group and um, elsewhere, this has been a useful exercise for other people too, to do these practice questions. Even the silly ones like where are my keys has been useful for some people. So I do think that that's a really, really good thing to do. So if you are still with me along in this journey, we are in the home stretch, folks. Look how little of the book we have left. So for next week, um, let's read interlude number five, which is about on being right. And let's actually read all the way through 
lesson nine, which is about putting it all together. And let's read interlude six on doubt with thoughts on arrogance and perfectionism. And we will reconvene in the next video. Talk to y'all later. Bye.